here we are on Broyles Ridge. Today's class is really thinking about perspective in a lot of different forms. So you did a reflection for today from Wednesday's um, class, right, and those readings. Um, so I want to start, so what we're going to do over the next little bit, I want us to just, anybody that feels like sharing kind of things that bubbled up for you when you did that exercise, the reflection exercise, we'll talk a little bit about what the, the reading, the, the article for today, what that means for ecology, and, um, and then we'll talk about what the heck we're going to do, and it, it relates to it. Um, we're going to think about north and south facing slopes and how, um, how to study how to study forests okay at any given time holler at me wave your hand questions are always welcome as we go along all right okay so to start anybody anybody feel like sharing anything that came that came to you or your perspective as you as you read the articles and then thought about what you saw when you were observing nature any anything you saw there you want to share Anything you liked about the articles or didn't like about the articles? They're very inspiring. Mm-hmm. The articles were? Good. Good. Kira? Yeah, I really like the article that talked about the uh, kind of global south and it's sort of where it's at with uh, scientific research. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah. And yet crazy that it kind of takes global events to, to make the scientific community have those conversations, right? Um, we've, Pete and I have done a lot of work in, um, in other parts of the world and we would have collaborators that would email us to send them articles because they were behind paywalls, like that alone, right? Um, if you're not in an academic setting, you can't get, let alone if you're not in a U.S. academic setting or, or European academic setting. So interesting, right? We'll talk more about that. Other, um, other reactions to any of the readings? Or your own observations? It's so meta. What did you observe about your observing? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, Hannah. I saw, I was in Hendersonville, and I saw some white squirrels. Yes. And they're so beautiful. I love them. I'm obsessed with them. And they're really only in the Brevard and Hendersonville area. Um, and I was thinking about how they're not albino. I thought that they were albino when I first saw one. And it's like a genetic like um, mutation from the gray squirrel that we're used to seeing. Um, and I was thinking about abundance and distribution and how like they probably have a just inherent um, disadvantage being white. They're kind of like a nice little target in the woods for predators. Mm -hmm. um, I was also thinking about like why they only stay in the specific area of Brevard. Yeah. Um, which would be all interesting information to find out. We had one errant individual at Bee Tree Road. Mark Brunner and I were obsessed with this white squirrel um, because they're usually only down in Brevard. And it was at Beach, right by the fire station there. And um, we kept tabs on it. Um, we haven't seen it in a little while. I think I heard that it passed. But, but right, interesting to think about. And the adaptations there, um, absolutely. And the lack thereof. Um, that is not advantageous in, in a world where blending in is going to work a lot better, right? Yeah. Other observations of your observations. <laughs> Yeah, Grace. Um, I just went down to the Jensen Trail and sat on a log because I could. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just started feeling really fortunate for several reasons. I mean, one, I had access to this campus, and I really had access to really beautiful houses. And, and I'm really fortunate in that way. And, um, I know a lot of people don't have that. Um, and I think just a lot because of that, but also because attitude towards wild spaces is very much like this is such a comforting place to be and like it feels like home in a way and I feel really fortunate to have that perspective on it because even growing up I had friends who were like you know afraid of bugs afraid of mud they would go outside and they'd get like scared of things and um, I just like I think as an individual it's really
Mm -hmm. And thinking about the privilege that comes with having had those positive experiences in nature, when not everybody has that positive experience, right, for various reasons. And so the privilege of that, of exposure that makes you comfortable, as opposed to, you know, um, really not feeling comfortable for myriad reasons, right? And um, so owning that and realizing not everybody, and I've, I've all read your feedback form. Some of you are like, yeah, but no bugs and snakes. Yeah, but I like the idea of it. So even among us, right, I know that some of you are more comfortable than others right now. And thank you for being here, sitting on the forest floor with me, um, with us, um, despite that, right? And I hope you get a little more um, exposure to, to those, those positive feelings, right, uh, of these places. Um, let's see, so any other, one more, one more chance for opening up for anybody's reflections on those readings, Drew Lanham and Aldo Leopold and um, Joy Mako. Good, all right. Uh, so given that I wanted you to reflect on your own perspective on looking at nature, to then think about how that affects who does science and the people that are doing science when they look at something, we can pretend science is objective. It is not. We all bring something to the table when we do science. And the sooner we stop saying science is an unbiased discipline and say, here's the bias I bring to it and I own that, and because of that, I need to hear other perspectives that are different than my own, right? I think the sooner we do that, the better all of our scientific fields are, whether it's ecology or medicine. Um, we see that the more, and we're gonna learn this in this class, nowhere else more than an ecology class do you learn that diversity of perspectives, diversity of, of talents and abilities always makes a community stronger, right? So we can pretend that um, social issues live outside of this space, but they don't. And I want to break down that barrier right now, all right? Um, yeah, Kira. Yeah, that also um, relates to, I took a three-month class on people race Yeah, last semester. Right. So it's not even just that science and you know the world are connected, but science can actually uh, be complicit in oppressing others. And so let's talk about that article, right? Exactly. The, the, uh, the academic system in boxing out, for example, the global south to even be able to publish in that world, therefore perpetuates the dominance of the global north in the scientific conversation, right? Exactly what you're saying. Uh, and so, right, the complicity, it doesn't, and, and I think hopefully um, if it's not something you've thought about before, we're all be really pushing ourselves and each other to think about it more that um, it's not enough to just to just uh, not do bad things but in, in and and be racist but we have to be actively anti-racist right actively dismantling these systems and that can be so this global north global south dynamic huge in ecology right um, and so so thinking about that what are some of the thinking about um, the dominant perspective in the global north and and that is a a very uh in and of itself problematic statement because the global north involves asia europe and N north america right but um that dominance in the scientific literature what do you think it does to what we know about a, a discipline like ecology what do we miss Even if those people from the Global North go to the Global South and say, hey, this is what I saw. The perspectives are from those from the Global South. Yeah, from the, the perspectives of those that, are, that intimately know those places and, and live in them and have for generations, right? Absolutely. What else? 
Exactly. What kind of experience, Bria? Um, I mean, I guess if you live in a place like longer than like other people, you know, like in a way. Right? Absolutely. And just that, that knowledge and generational knowledge, right? And that too, I mean, the, the poem Remember, right? Just thinking about the generations of pine trees that have lived on this ridge, the generations of humans long before colonial powers came here that lived on this ridge, knew this ridge, knew it, you know? Um, so indigenous knowledge of these places. And, and so that experience, we shouldn't underestimate that kind of knowledge. But so often academia, the academy, says you're a scientist if you publish papers. What are all the barriers to publishing papers? A degree, access to education, language. language, having the right ability. There are a few journals that will publish in two languages, Journal of Conservation Biology. It's always like English and Spanish, but that's two languages. Okay, <laughs> there are a lot on the planet, right? Hmm. Technology, absolutely. Money. Money, definitely. Even to be able to do the research and... Yes. Trust, yeah. What do you mean, Avi? Uh, well, if you said something else in the past, people would be like, this person just trying to get attention. Mm-hmm. And building, there's this sense of, and there's also a kind of building of notoriety in the field and like, oh, well, if that person said it. But that's super problematic, right? Um, who we give authority to, right? And whose voices we don't give credence to because it's in oral tradition or it's it's not it didn't come out of published papers right so i hope we're all on board that science a science like ecology is not immune to these issues right and we got to own our own biases and we got to think about that and something as simple as which side of the trees does moss grow on the north side if we're here couple things. One, if the conditions are just right. If we went to Brevard where it's 100 inches of rain a year, do not use that rule because moss grows everywhere. <laughs> All around the tree. It is so wet and cool everywhere. Good luck, right? There's like a window of conditions where that works well. Let alone Global South, it's the opposite. You're going to walk all the way to the South Pole if you're trying to, you know, you could go the wrong way um, if you're using that rule, right? So perspective matters and, and bias matters, right? And, um, and we've got we've to own it and realize it, right? And the truth is that um, I want you to be able to look at a forest and think about what you see. Right? So, so if you look up and look at these trees, I already know some of you feel more comfortable than others. So who is from the Southern Appalachians here? Who among you are from the Southern Appalachians? Not a whole lot, right? Who among you knows generally what this is? Maybe, everybody has a little piece of it, so take a peek, all right? Your, your pine, I told you it was a pine. Baby pine here. You do. It's right at your feet. The yeah. gen the circle of it? life. I, 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 I literally, what's been going through my mind is, how old is this pine? Yeah. This little pine. Right yep. here. I old. know. It's it's not too old, but it's older than you might think. It takes a long time just to get to there. <laughs> it's a big it? journey. I'm not sure. Will I, forestry folk? I don't know. I'd say three oh, years. Two years. It could be anywhere from five years to ten years old. Yeah, depending this on. One? Yeah. yeah. They can be real, it's, it's, it takes a while. Um, okay, so pine trees. Here's the thing is because of where I'm from, I'm from the Northern Rockies. I look at this and I studied, I, I did a lot of my schooling in Colorado. So I look at this and I can say pine. Because of my training, I can look at this and say pine. And let me tell you, convey this knowledge so you can also say that. Look at it and I want you to notice something. Follow the needles all the way down to the stem. What do you see? Fascicle. They're in little clumps that we call fascicles, all right? They're in little clumps, right? How many needles are in a clump? Five-ish. I bet if you look at a few, you might get a few aberrations from five, but five-ish, okay? Um, I want you to look at your other sample that I gave you. Your hemlock. Mm -hmm. 
What do you notice about its needles? Flat. They're flat needles. Are they in clumps? No. No, every one gets its own little attachment point, right? That's the first thing. So when we're identifying trees, we say, okay, does it have needles or broad leaves? That might be a good place to start. These both have needles, and the average person on the street calls both of these pines. And while they're both in Pinaceae, the family, that's where it stops, okay? These are pines because they come in those clusters of needles, and they're elongated. There are some with shorter and longer needles than this. You should see a longleaf pine, well named. Um, but then we have things like spruces and firs and hemlocks that each needle gets its own little connection point, okay? Now these species have different adaptations to the world around them. Um, uh, 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 let's see. If you um, come from a Christian tradition, then you maybe have this, or, or pagan, because that's actually where it started, have this tradition of bringing a tree in your house once a year right when you stop and say it like that like that's kind of weird all right like, <laughs> let's just question what we think is normal sometimes right all right but we bring a tree into the house um, um a, a christmas tree anybody know generally what kind of tree they are Spruce. sometimes Spruce. Uh, let me give you so they're often firs and the reason um where when i learned ecology i learned the different spruce and fir as spiky spruce and friendly fir. So I can tell you, if you're hauling a tree into your house, a friendly fir is a much happier thing to haul in. The tips of a spruce are very, very pointy, 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 very sharp. They draw blood. They can, if, you, if they hit the right part of you. And um, so the spruces and firs are, um, anybody know where around here we see them? They aren't on campus, naturally. Where do we find them? High, 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 above 5,000 feet or so, okay? Remember in the lecture I said elevation can serve as, a, as an analog to latitude, right? Most of the spruces and firs on this planet, uh, on the, excuse me, well, yes, but um, <laughs> kind of, most of them on this continent are in the northern latitudes. They're in Canada. They're maybe in the upper parts of the United States. And they're then sometimes in mountain locations, Colorado, Montana, Idaho, and at the tippy tops of mountains around here because it's colder and it's wetter, right? Colder and wetter. And that, cold, that moisture and the cold are things that something like this, a hemlock, is also fairly well adapted to. But it can come lower in elevation. But anybody know where, where generally, if it's at low elevations, we find it? What do we find it near? What do we find, where do hemlocks like to be? Wet. They like to be near creeks and things. Um, so we see a pattern here, right? These, these conifers like this, not the pines necessarily, but the conifers like this like it kind of cool and wet. And they're actually built for it. Up in those high elevations, um, look at this limb. What might do this wind? What else? Snow? They, are with, they can withstand that. What? Yeah, people. I don't think that was a selective pressure in this case, right? But it, it, it's helpful for my demonstration. And the, um, yeah, they're really well built for those cold, wet, extreme, um, heavy snows, for example. Um, when we lived in Boulder, Colorado, which is meant to be kind of like, yeah, not only Julie's hometown, but also, um, <laughs> Um, it's mostly kind of like high desert moving into montane forest. It's a lot of pine trees and things. But here's the thing, as, as European colonists moved their way across the continent, they picked up things they liked and took them. <laughs> so they got to the Midwest and saw, and, and even here, and saw, oh, I love the colors those maples make in the, in, the, in the fall, and I love the feeling of an oak tree. And so they carried those deciduous trees out there with them. Man alive, every single spring. Here come the oaks and the maples. It's spring, we're gonna leaf out and here we go. 
and those big old leaves catch the snow and all their branches break off. <laughs> Meanwhile, all the conifers are like, hey, we're good. Because they're built for that environment, right? They're adapted to that environment. We got this, it just bounces off us. This is what we're built for, right? They're built for that climate and environment. Um, and so everything has its niche. We're gonna talk about this next week. Every species has the conditions that it is ideal for. And there are some, there's some wiggle room around that, right? Humans just bust through our niche. We're like, oh, too cold. I've got an app for that. Let me just build, cl make clothing for myself or some kind of shelter or fire, right? Oh, too dry, let's, there's water. If we dig far enough, there is water down there and pipe it on up, right? We blow through our niche boundaries. Spoiler alert, this never ends well, <laughs> all right? It never ends well to live beyond our means, right? So we'll talk about that when we get to populations, and, but we'll talk about it as niches, niches as well, or niches. We had this wonderful professor in college um, from Australia, and she said niche with such elegance and grace. And I'm from Idaho, and it's a niche. I just, it is. It's also a coyote. Call it what you want for you, but to me, it's a coyote. And sometimes it's a crick, and that's just instead of a creek. And that's just where I come from, right? My bias that I bring, and I sometimes, and, and I refuse to be apologetic about it, right? There are times that I, the creek thing, yeah, people mock me, so I fix the creek thing more often, but uh, the coyote I stopped trying a long time ago. Um, anyway, coyote is what a lot of people say. Um, yeah, depends. It's a regional thing, um, like, like, a lot of, like a lot of stuff. Um, oh. Some of you have had classes with me before. <laughs> We digress a lot, but, but hang with me, there's a point. Uh, so, adaptations and niches, right? These things are built for certain environments. And so when you start to look carefully, the reason something is where it is, is usually for a good reason. Now, it's not necessarily because it's where it best grows, but it's for a good reason. Um, oh shoot, did I drop this thing? Oh. I love those things, so I'm going to plant them. I'm going to pick on Pete's dad, who was an amazing guy, very ecologically minded, um, and, and generally very in tune with nature. But he loved Russian olive trees, which are uh, crazy invasive. And he's like, we need more Russian olives. He never planted them, but man, he loved them, right? And I think we had to hold him back, you know? <laughs> People love those things. Uh, and there are a lot of the things that are invasive, they perpetuate because they're pretty and or they smell nice or there's a reason we liked them and we moved them around, right? Well, I dropped my other cone, but... Um, are species in it on their own? Not necessarily. Who, besides the pine tree, might benefit from a pine cone? A squirrel. Exactly. Now, here's the thing about squirrels. They are cash hoarders, we call them. They like to hoard things. And now there are a couple ways. If you're a red squirrel, which likes to be way up high in the mountains, they make giant mounds and they defend them with a ch you don't hear the gray squirrels on campus doing that to you very much, right? And it's because they're scatter hoarders. They put a couple here and an acorn there and a couple there. And they have this internal map. They have this internal, I know, I, there, there are a lot of pine trees. I don't mean to sound callous, but not all of them are gonna they're not all going to make it. <laughs> exactly, but you're right. I do respect my, my fellow species. Um, the thing about scatter hoarders is I, as a scattered person, can relate. You drop some things sometimes, or you, you misplace them, or you get picked off by an owl. And then <laughs> that, which for you was simply for your own purposes of getting food, becomes a seed dispersal mechanism, right? So seed dispersal, so species are not in it alone. So why a pine is somewhere might partially be because its parents are right above and they dropped right here. 
but also you might get one in slightly outside of where they are already because a squirrel decided, got, got it in its brain to move it somewhere, right? And so also, have y'all been to Christmas Tree Hill on campus? Some of you have. Is that forest seem natural? No. <laughs> um, no, very much planted in a plantation style, right? So you gotta watch all the manipulations that have happened to a landscape when you look at it. Um, but we can study, this is what we do. So remember those definitions of ecology, we study the distribution and abundance. So today that's what we're gonna do is collect data on the distribution and abundance of the two species you're looking at here, hemlocks and pines. And then on, on, um, on Monday, we're gonna analyze it and get at the mechanism behind it. Why do we think, why do we see the patterns that we do? And, um, and let's just start by asking, based on just the little bit that you know and you've heard from me now and what you know about north and south facing slopes. Let's recap north and south facing slopes. Here we are in the northern hemisphere. This is the northern north facing slope. How does its um, climatic condition differ from the south facing slope? Colder. You're all feeling it now. We got all blood pumping as we were coming up the hill and it was nice and warm and now I've been sitting for a little too long because Lisa won't stop talking and the wind picked up and the sun went away and I'm cold. But yes, it will always be slightly cooler, right? The sun will always be slightly in our southern sky because we're about 35 degrees. Um, north and remember what was it around 23 degrees is those those tropics right yeah yeah um so we are so perspective right and we're going to collect a little data on what is where so based on what you know what do you think pines and hemlocks where are they going to want to be why it's also wetter. cooler wetter conifers yeah because one more thing I didn't talk about, why can conifers, not only are they resilient, you know, to snow and stuff, but a big, nice, broad leaf gets frost damaged like that. It has a lot of surface area exposed. Every layer of biology is basically about surface area, right? Cell transport, hormones, all of it have to do with, with, um, with surface area, amount of surface area exposed, right? And how much can travel. That's why the mitochondrion and the chloroplast have all the folds, right? For lots of transport. Um, there are times it's not good to have a lot of surface area exposed. And so things like pines and, and other conifers are well adapted to dealing with that. Though pines are weird, y'all. There are yellow and white pines. White pines, this is an eastern white pine, is a little more in that vein with the other conifers, all right? But as you know, uh, it's, it's a little more, it like, uh, well, if you saw a yellow pine, you would know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so um, longleaf pine, shortleaf pine, Virginia pine, there are a bunch of those that are yellow pines. And they are more adapted to ponderosa pine. I could keep going, I'll stop. But adapted to fire. Thick bark. They self-prune. So they drop their lower limbs off. So fire can cruise along and clear out the understory. And that, one of, on, after our grasslands in North America, the second most endangered ecosystem is, is uh, longleaf pine ecosystems in the southeastern US. Anybody from like Georgia, Florida, few of you, or at least have driven that way, you're supposed to be driving through longleaf pine for hours. And we just don't anymore. We've cleared that landscape. We've turned it to agriculture and then to cities, right? Um, and so it's a very endangered ecosystem Then a lot of endangered species come along with that. Um, uh, so those, but they're built for fire because the Southeast is not a cold, wet, boreal Canada kind of place, right? Yeah, little bits of it at the top of our mountains, but not generally. Um, yeah, yeah. And it's meant to, it, it's meant to happen, but the thing is we suppress it for so much, and we'll talk about this later in the class, but we suppress fire and all these little guys, this is why I'm not that, you know, um, little trees like this, if they all are allowed to grow up, become ladder fuel, 
we call it, and just let fire carry straight up to the canopy where normally if you had every five to 10 years a fire coming through, it would take out these little guys so the big ones could keep doing their thing, right? So, um, what else? Um, so, pines, but this is a white pine, okay? This belongs more to the likes it wetter and cooler environment. And so we would expect conifers probably to like the North Slope a little bit more. But I want you to already, as you're out here, think about the reasons that may or may not be the case as we, um, and think about how long people have been here. And, and I, I wanna be clear that um, forest manipulation did not start in the 1600s. Cherokee, the Cherokee manipulated and managed these landscapes um, for, for certainly thousands of years prior to colonial powers coming here. So, so what is natural is, a, is an open question and maybe a pointless question, right? Because it puts a level of remoteness from nature of humanity and it also puts a level of who's, who gets to decide that gets really messy and slippery really fast, right? What we do know is some ecological rules that make the world go round. And that's what I'm gonna teach you in this class that regardless of what the history is, how will it move forward is, is an important question. Um, okay, almost done talking. Does everybody, anybody need to get up and like do jumping jacks or are you okay? You can, we can do it. I won't require it. Anybody wanna do? Okay. Okay, all right. I won't talk too much longer. If we're gonna study a forest, how do you do it? What questions do you have about this forest? What kinds of questions would you ask? What do you, what might you ask? Kira? Uh, totally, what kinds of trees are here? How many, where are they? Where are they not? What are their little micro habitats that they found, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. used for anything before. Yep, totally, totally. How might you be able to tell that, by the way? Like stone walls and stuff? Yep, and even would the trees tell you? Yeah, like lone wolf trees. Well, and just the age. Sometimes you'll go in and if everything's about the same age, you're like, oh, this was logged or burned or something then. Um, how can you tell the age of a tree? Rings, so we can do cores and you can get a tiny little core and count the rings. Um, and that tells you a lot within a species and it, it's, it's sketchy, but, but roughly you can also sometimes use size. Um, so here's just one more example of why social and, um, and, and natural science issues are not removed from one another. Um, we measure, the standard for measuring a tree is what? Anybody know for how big it is? DBH. DBH. Diameter at breast height. Diameter at 4.3 at 4.3 feet. Come on. Yeah, white male Scandinavian. I call it DCH. It is diameter at chin height for me, right? Like, <laughs> come on, man. That is um, clearly something that has been named by somebody who's a standard five foot ten right um so it's dch on me you want to figure out what it is on you all right it's about 4.3 feet in height but on me and then you use this um and this is a marvel of geometric um purposes it's a dbh tape and it just uses um the equation of circumference but it's built in so while there are inches on one side, this says it is an inch. I don't know, there's a, we can talk about perspective, but, we, but that is not an inch, right? Ah, oh, but it is. This tree is seven and a half inches in diameter. If we involve pi in the equation, right? Pi D. Um, if, we involve, if we calculate circumference, but it does it for us. So you could, you could measure the outside 
and then divide whatever I'm not I forget or multiply or something <laughs> so you would measure the outside and divide by pi right and you would get the diameter of the tree but this is for the lazy scientist that has to do a lot of these and therefore um, you just do this and it is seven and a half dbh diameter at dch liesel's chin height okay all right so we might whoo, <laughs> that could have gone on forever um I'm exposing you all to some of this every time we do a lab because you're going to do projects in this class. So I want you to be thinking about like, if I wanted to study X, how would I do it? Oh, Liesl showed me that thingamajig that allows me to know how big a tree is. So you could maybe tell, all right, are the pine trees bigger here or somewhere else? And you'd have a question about why that might be, right? You, would have, you could identify trees. Um, conifers are nice in the winter, <laughs> right? Um, people like Dave Ellum are really good at bark identification. I'm not that person. I tell many people, um, I am very, very proud of the fact that I can identify every tree in Colorado, every tree. None of you should be impressed by this. There are like 12. Seriously, there are not. Yeah, it is not impressive. I like, it's boastful because it's ridiculous. You got your aspen, you got like two kinds of fur, one of which isn't a real fur, and no, yeah, I can count on like two hands the number of trees there, not impressive. Here, I'm like, well, it's an oak, right? I'm, I'm learning, but I'm not, I'm not the expert, okay? So um, we're getting there. Not a lot of water. Hmm? Yes, exactly, it's dry, so there isn't, there, there aren't, yep. There just isn't the diversity, but boy, is there grass diversity and sagebrush and sh shrubs. Yeah. People don't realize how many different types of grass there are. So many types of grass. That will give you their entire books on that. All right, so we might study the species of trees. We might study where they are. We might study how big they are. Um, what else might you want to study? Well, actually, let me back up for a second, because if we wanted to know where they are, let's say we wanted to compare one place to another. You can't just like walk out in a forest and say, OK, one, two, three, four. And then over here, uh, I see one, two, three, four. You need some kind of standard of measurement, right? Yeah, Kira. Could you do like a sample size? Of the totally. So we're either there are a few ways to do that, and that's what we're going to do today. I want you to be exposed to the idea of a transect and plot-based sampling. So we're gonna do both of those things, all right? A transect is just a line that you walk and you sample for whatever it is you're doing along that line. Now there are a few ways to do it. You can walk and in the case of um, small stuff, little, tr little like shrubs or I'm a wildlife biologist so I might be looking for rabbit scat, right? So I want you laugh, this is my life. Like so many of my hours of my life are looking for rabbit poop. You don't have no idea. So you walk along and you look for whatever it is you're looking for and you count it. Now, sometimes that's pretty tedious. And let's say I was looking at leaves, holy cow. So instead you might say, well, every, every meter, I'm gonna put a flag down and I'm gonna say, okay, it's touching an oak leaf. Well, it's touching a red oak leaf and a chestnut oak leaf and a white oak leaf, okay? I'm gonna do leaves right now. And when, it's, when Southern Appalachia it's, is doing its thing in the summer, I could do this and hit as many small plants as there are trees in Colorado, right? Um, <laughs> that is Southern Appalachia. And so um, you might do this and that's called a point intercept method. So every meter, for example, you'll, you'll count everything that's touching that thing. Um, you could also do a belt transect um, because maybe you want to, maybe something like a tree, I could technically walk for a while and never hit a tree. Um, but if I wanted to, cal wanted to characterize this forest, I might do a belt transect. So I would estimate a meter on either side of me and I'd walk and any tree that makes it into my belt gets counted along the way. Okay, that's a belt transect. So there are lots of ways we can do transects. Um, but then it's also, 
<laughs> the human mind is crazy. You cannot assume that you would, I'm gonna randomly walk. You're not gonna randomly walk, I guarantee. You cannot do it. Your human mind cannot randomly walk. So we have to build randomness into our sampling. And you're gonna hear me say this until you're very tired of it. But you either have to randomize or standardize. Okay, so you either randomize or standardize. Today we're gonna to do standardized because we have a question that involves north and south facing slopes. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to have you sample east and west, right? But you might wanna randomize in certain situations because you wouldn't wanna subconsciously, well, it seems easier to walk downhill. I'm just gonna go this. Or, well, there's a big tree right there, but if I kind of walk right here, even if you don't think you're gonna do it, you do it, I promise. So we have to randomize. Um, so there are lots of ways to randomize. Anybody, how might you randomize what direction you're gonna go? Yes, Evie. Um, turn around in circles and throw it. It's true. I once read a paper that, um, I once read a paper that was studying pikas, which is this little rabbit relative that I study, but they were studying it in the Himalaya. And um, the way that they decided where they were gonna sample is they picked up a piece of yak dung and they threw it behind their shoulder and wherever it landed is where they started their transects. You use what you got. No, for real, you use what you got. You know what, Can you, I, I want, I'm gonna do something and I'm gonna learn from past times and back up a little bit. But I, I want, I'm gonna do something and I want you to tell me if you think I have intentionally placed this stick. Anybody play baseball, softball? Or seen people do the dizzy bat? Not only am I dizzy, but can anybody question, did I put that somewhere intentionally? I guarantee you I didn't, all right? The dizzy bat method works, and here is my stick. Now, I re recommend not using a stick in a forest, right? But something brighter, I could have used a flag. Um, I just saw my stick, where did it go? It's right here, right? And so then, it's pointing this way, and maybe I'll say this was the tip, so I'm gonna walk that way, right? So you can do things like that. I suppose you can also use technology. <laughs> There are random number generators on the free apps on every device that you can get now. Um, mine's called Numero Rama. All right, but random number generator. And that's not it, sorry. Um, does this need to be this way? I messed you up, I'm sorry. I'm triggering my memory of when I took some ecology classes in Bermuda. Like, some things that, that I haven't remembered for a long time are like... Coming back to you. Coming back to me and I'm like... Because some ecological truths are universal I'm and like, others are I, very I, biased. I, I just remember the time <laughs> like we went to a beach and we threw this thingy and then we made these belts and we were told, well, there's a lot of little tiny plastics so don't walk in the transit because you'll press it down and mm -hmm. then you won't see it. Totally. So stay out. So we like had these Stay things. outside. So they had to be the width of your of your yeah, so arm so you could pick everything right up. Over it. Yep. But Totally. And then just counting like how many little bits of plastic, how many big pieces of plastic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had a whole data set of like and um and the teacher told us and on, we did it in many different ways. Like we had the belt, we had the hoops, we had um, some uh, quadrats, squares, quadrats, and yeah. Quadrants. And we went to so many different places. We went to the shoreline, uh, uh, a beach, uh, many different little habitats. And we were told, you're counting this, you're counting this uh here here we go let's work as a group totally and then we'll go back and we will categorize that data so here we go and if you have standardized methods or consistent randomized methods where you do the some similar things in similar place in, in different places you can compare those data right and that's what's important about this it, it often doesn't matter what you do as long as you're consistent about it 
right? That's going to be most important in, in design. Um, why might I use a compass to randomize direction? How might I use a compass to randomize direction? You can pair it with a random number generator. Uh, with a magnet? <laughs> yeah, that, then, then I don't know if it would be compromised. But you can use a random number generator to pick a number between 0 and 360. And that's the direction you're going to walk, um, 0 to 360. You can then tell it also, you know, let's say I didn't want to get everything right by a trail. You would say random number generator, pick a number between 0 and 50. And that's the number of paces or meters you walk away from the trail for any given sample so that they're not all right in the same place, right next to the trail, right? So there are lots of ways to, to do this. Um, what we're going to do today is sample the trees and it's winter and so we're focused on the the white pines and the hemlocks that should be all the conifers you see um a holly is a broad-leafed evergreen we're not counting hollies okay we're just counting the conifers so the needly things um pines and hemlocks which you got samples of i'm going to spread you out we're going to be in um let's see i think we have 16 of you today so four groups of four each you're going to spread out along this trail and each group is going to sample four times. You're going to sample, do two samples on the north side of the slope and two samples on the south side of the slope. All right, so um, before I explain any more about what we're doing, why don't you get yourselves in four groups of four and I will distribute your supplies because then you can um, see what you're going to be using while I uh, explain it. So get yourselves in gr four groups of four. I can count off if you want, but I think you can manage to assemble. Make sure I counted right. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen. Yeah. All right. So we got a group of four here, a group of four here. Are y'all in need? Evie looks like, yeah. All right. Okay. Everybody send a representative over to come grab a bag, please. Well, I'm close. I'll get you a bag. All right. Grab a bag. Grab a bag. Woo. You okay? <laughs> okay, so in your bag, first of all, pull out the clipboard and it will have your data sheet and on the back are the instructions. So in each bag, there should be a data sheet on a clipboard. All right, so what you can see um, on the back, you'll see the instructions, but I'll walk you through it right now. I'm going to spread you out. We'll spread for each group out so that you each take a spot along the ridge. Um, you're going to mark your starting point in the trail. So one of your flags is to mark where you are on the trail. That's mostly so I can find you. <laughs> So I know it's a little beacon, so I know it's like the rope uh, when you're diving or whatever to be able to <laughs> find, find where you are. So you're going to mark that uh, along the trail. Um, and then we are going to, you're going to use your compasses and everybody should have a compass in each bag. Now today we're doing very easy compassing because we are going north and south. But I have a question for you. We've roughly said where north is. Where does everybody pull out your compass in your bag? And tell me which way your compass is telling you is north. Face north. How do you know? So if you're not familiar, I want to give you a quick compass 101. You'll notice. You can turn the dial around this. So do not trust the numbers. <laughs> what should you trust on a compass? The arrow? 
the, the needle that's floating in water inside. And if you, um, if you are holding the compass, maybe try to hold it out in the center of your group so others can see it. Uh, low enough that others can see. <laughs> Others can see it. So you'll see the needle. And so you can turn the compass, but the needle remains pointing in a certain direction, right? Okay, so now turn the dial until what we call Red Fred is in the shed. Red Fred in the shed, all right? So the little, there's a little um, red empty arrow that turns underneath the dial, right? Get that aligned so that the red needle, now you gotta be, realize if you haven't already, you've gotta hold it level, otherwise things get wonky, okay? So a quick compass lesson, how would you figure out which, um, which direction 150 degrees is? If I want to face 150 degrees. So would you orient it north and then look where 150 degrees points? So the best way to do it, there's a little, you'll see a little white mark on the, underneath the dial. Do you notice underneath it, there's a white dash? When you turn the dial, the white dash stays pointing toward the, where the red arrow does on the base. You see the white dash? Everybody? So make, turn the dial until the 150. Let's do 140 because there's a number for it. It's easy. 140 is aligned with that white mark, right? So you turn the dial until the 140 is aligned with the white mark. Now turn your body so that Red Fred is in the shed. Turn your body. That's 140 degrees. Wait. Oh, okay. So, oh, oh, oh. so we have a whole class in orienteering. You're not going to get too lost today, but I just wanted to give you a taste of it, all right? The nice thing today, when I tell you to walk north, follow the red needle. When I tell you to walk south, follow the black needle. We have one compass that got backwards, but I don't think I brought it today. And it comes very obvious very quickly if we have that one, all right? Okay, so you're gonna walk, back to the instructions. You're gonna walk to, uh, you're gonna walk in the direction and I'm gonna have every other group. Um, one group starts going north, the next group will go south, okay? You're gonna walk 30 meters, so you're gonna use the measuring tape. You'll see in your bag there's a measuring tape. Uh, many of the measuring tapes have two sides. You want the metric side that is 30, so, and you're gonna walk 30 meters. And when you get to 30 meters, plant a flag, one of the flags that you have. And then you're gonna map out a 10 meter um, circumference around that point. So use your measuring tape, and you can use the other flags if you want to kind of, um, so I'm gonna, so here's my center flag. And instead of um, 10, 10 meters, I'm gonna do like half a meter right here, but you're gonna plant flags all around it. And then as a group, you count every tree that is over two meters tall. Two meters is roughly six feet. So you know how tall you are and you can probably guesstimate. You can also use your thing to figure it out. But just count, and you're just counting them. Number of pines or hemlocks that are taller than two meters in your plot. And then walk another 30 meters in the same direction, do the same thing, come back to the trail when you're done with that and go down the other slope. And the other thing is why on earth would trees be on one side or the other? You've all been given a thermometer. These are digital thermometers, so you can turn it on. Make sure it's reading Celsius. You just hit the little Fahrenheit Celsius button if you need it. Um, and 
it'll give you now you got to take the sheath off of it y'all there's a sheath on the here you got to take that off but then don't hold it like this or shockingly it will be 98 degrees like the 20 whatever uh, celsius <laughs> because you're holding the needle so hold it by the top all right and watch it it'll kind of equilibrate so wait till it kind of is centered on a temperature and you're going to take both a soil temperature and an air temperature in each of your plots if you flip over your sheet you'll see there's a spot for you to write each of these so in your group of four you need a recorder you need a you need a temperature person you need your great um, adventurous spirit that is willing to take the, the compass and the measuring tape and forge a path. All right, now here's the thing, the one true rough, you've learned two things about the truth of ecology field work today. One is in whatever weather, two is if you hit a tree, you hit a tree. Don't, you gotta do your best to kind of just slightly go around it, but like, let's say my transect were right here. Sorry, Pete. Notice I didn't see it coming and go around it. You go up to it and then go around and then get yourself back aligned and keep walking, okay? For this reason, as I lay you out, if you didn't notice there's a big cliff, <laughs> I've got it pretty well in my head where that is. So just be sure to go where I tell you to go so you don't go off the cliff and use your, your intelligent brains to not go off the cliff, <laughs> all right? Any questions about what you're doing? Yes. Um, so you go 30 meters to the plot and then it's 10 meters around the center flag. And it should say all of this on the back if you forget. But you can also yell at me, just holler. I'm, this is, I get, the, I get so much exercise on today. I'm just gonna be walking back and forth, listening for people <laughs> calling my name. So if you need me. Um, just holler at me, all right, um, if you have questions. But have fun. Use your power of observation while you're out here. Notice cool things. There's a box turtle that lives somewhere around here. Our class found that box turtle. You know, keep your eyes peeled for fun things. Um, and have fun out here. Anything else?